Um, so to introduce our city, uh, we're an inner city local government just to the north of the Perth CBD. We have a very environmentally progressive community and they've spoken loud and clear over the years um, and told us that they expect to see a significantly better environmental performance uh, from new developments in our city than what would be considered uh, the status quo or business as usual for new development in the in the wider Perth metro area. So we have listened and over the last 10 years have initially introduced and then gradually increased uh, the environmentally sustainable design requirements that we place on new development in our city. Um, and uh, where we have arrived at is um, that all new development that requires a, a, a development approval in our city now needs to demonstrate a significant improvement in their uh, environmental performance compared to uh, business as usual. Uh, could I ask you to move on to the next slide, Maria, please? Thank you. So this slide, I guess, gives us a little bit of an overview of where our current built form policy, the policy that um, our planners have to uh, assess all uh, development applications against, where we've currently arrived with that policy is that for a residential developments that includes all multiple dwellings and single dwellings, including detached houses uh, and group dwellings, we now require them to achieve a 50% reduction on uh, lifetime carbon emissions compared to the business as usual development that we would otherwise see as standard in Perth uh, if we didn't have our requirements in place um, and similarly a 50% reduction in net fresh water use over the lifetime of that building. Uh, commercial developments will require 30% for carbon reduction and 25% for water um, and that's having taken into consideration um, how much more difficult it can be for commercial developments to achieve those reductions and we have worked with eTool to help us set those targets and then for all other buildings types um, we've got um, we've got targets of the, the 50 and 25 percent actually Maria I think that might be that might still be a typo on the card 50 I think it's actually meant to be 30 and, and 25 but that's okay um, happy to share our policy <laughs> um, so all types just try to tries to capture everything that is not a residential or a commercial where that development is a mixed-use development we ask them to do a separate residential and a commercial assessment for those two parts so the reason that we've chosen to use a life cycle assessment as a methodology for our applicants to show their environmental performance is that we really wanted to be able to quantify what we were achieving with our requirements. Uh, initially, we considered just creating a checklist that applicants could tick off certain uh, technologies and design features on, but we rapidly realised that First of all, not all technologies and design features are going to be suitable for every context. Um, and secondly, that we simply couldn't know how much of an impact we would be having um, through that kind of checklist approach. Um, and therefore, we arrived at the life cycle assessment methodology because it quantifies very clearly the amount of carbon and water uh, saved over the lifetime of each development. So the screen that we're on at the moment is actually showing an excerpt from our uh, built form policy. Um, on the left hand side, it shows what we call our design principles and local housing objectives. Uh, the first three of those actually talk to the more qualitative parts of environmentally sustainable design and, and to some extent to the comfort of living in, in these types of developments. Um, those qualitative um, uh, measures are also then reflected within the life cycle assessment in that uh, maximising passive solar heating, et cetera, is going to be reflected in the carbon performance as well. Um, but we do want applicants to just take the time to really describe how they've achieved those. So that's what those first three objectives on the left-hand side of screen are about. Uh, the fourth one at the bottom is really referring to the uh, the report that we require every application to submit um, and for single dwellings and group dwellings so those smaller residential scale developments we do specify life cycle assessment as the methodology um, you will see on the right side of our screen um, the top part of the table also talks about the green building council's green star rating system uh, which we accept as an alternative for larger developments so um, large apartment buildings mixed use and commercial 
commercial developments where that Green Star rating applies. Currently, um, Green Star is really not yet suitable for those very small scale, uh, single and group dwelling type developments. So um, we, we do just specify the LCA for those. Um, can I get you to move on to the next slide, Maria? Lovely, thank you. So this is actually a screenshot of part of uh, the fact sheet that we provide to uh, the um, applicants who have got um, single and group dwellings um, coming our way. Uh, those um, two types of dwellings are the most recent addition to the list of, of uh, development types for which we now require a life cycle assessment or evidence of environmentally sustainable design. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over 10 years, we've gradually introduced these requirements and we started originally um, only applying them to um, the much larger developments and have gradually brought them in for the smaller scale. Now we're at the point where it does apply to all developments that require a development approval. Um, so this is really an excerpt from the, the um, fact sheet that we give to applicants to help them walk through that process, explaining what life cycle assessment is all about um, and how they would go about uh, getting one done, trying to make it as easy for them as possible. Um, now, there's a lot of numbers there and for a lot of people it can still be quite overwhelming, so we're doing our best to help them. Um, and that's where LCA, uh, sorry, Rapid LCA um, really comes into its own. We've been really pleased to be able to work with eTool to help them uh, develop and refine this tool um, because it creates a much easier pathway for applicants to be essentially able to do a DIY version of an LCA assessment where they can sit down um, and the app guides them through the process of doing their own assessment um, that will still give us um, an outcome that we can interpret um, with quantified performance outcomes uh, just as easily as we could a desktop study done through um, employing and engaging a, a assessor to do that for them. Um, so can we move on to the next slide, please, please, Maria? Thank you. Um, so this slide um, shows a little bit of a snapshot of what comes through to us at the city uh, once an applicant has completed their rapid LCA assessment. First of all, um, on the left hand side, it gives the planner who's assessing the application a, a really quick snapshot to show uh, whether the, uh, the development has or will achieve through their design our uh, ESD requirements. So in this case, it's showing that um, this development would achieve an 80% saving um, against our target of 50%. So they're well and truly exceeding our target uh, for global warming potential or, or carbon emissions. And uh, that they're also more than meeting our net fresh water use savings. So that makes it really easy because immediately the planner is able to tick the box to say, yep, our ESD requirements are met in terms of performance standards. And then on the right of the screen um, goes on to um, the rest of the report, which then um, really provides that robustness in terms of the planners being able to drill down into where those uh, greenhouse gas and water savings are coming from uh, in that development. And I think Maria, you, thank you Maria, she's just switching to um, the actual um, PDF version of that report to give us a little bit more detail. So um, that table above that we've just scrolled past basically shows where, which areas um, of the building um, and whether it's embodied versus use and so forth, where those savings are coming from in each of the areas of energy and water. Um, and then further down, uh, what we're looking at is um, each of the highlighted rows, the yellow rows show where the applicant within the app has changed from the default template. So we've set our default template to essentially be the status quo business as usual development that would normally be produced in accordance with the building codes of Australia um, without the addition of environmental design features. Um, so that's what they start with as they blank template um, and then every change that they make um, to that template is shown as a yellow highlight and hopefully every change they make improves the environmental performance. So that allows our 
our planners to see um, very quickly uh, where the changes have been made um, and to, um, I guess, pick out and focus on anywhere where that change that's been made may seem a little bit out of the ordinary or perhaps a little bit unreasonable. They can drill down and maybe ask some questions and investigate just in case um, somebody's really tried to put something unrealistic in or, um, or they've made a mistake. Um, but that is the overview of the, um, the report that comes out to us. It makes life easier for our planners and it makes life easier and, and more affordable for the applicants. So we're hoping that in this way, um, we're going to get really great outcomes for everyone involved.